Megan Sage. Our next speaker is the CEO of Volute. That's a hydrogen storage startup company in San Francisco. And this thing started out as a small government grant funded company and now it has millions and millions of dollars in revenue. I'm going to introduce you now to Daniel Recht, he was also, interestingly enough, a semi-finalist in our Cube Challenge, and he'll be speaking today about questions raised by alternative fuels and self-driving cars. Please give him a warm welcome to the main stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for listening to me instead of eating lunch. I take that as a point of personal pride, and I offer you great gratitude for it. My name is Dan Recht. I'm the CEO of Volute. And what I want to do today is make you a little bit uncomfortable about self-driving cars and get you to think some deep and interesting questions about them. I have no answers for you, but I hope that at the end of my talk, you'll be wondering some new things. A little bit about my background. I'm trained as a physicist and a materials engineer. My doctorate's in materials engineering. However, all I've ever done is business, and so I'm a pretty mixed person. What I've got behind me now is a picture outside my window in San Francisco. And there's a couple of things I want to highlight about this. The first is that because San Francisco has so many hills, it's very easy to have a nice apartment with a great view. About half of the apartments have that view. The other half of the apartments don't have to walk up hills, so you get your choice. And the reason I'm showing this is to illustrate the variety of land uses in San Francisco. So we've got downtown, which you can see on the far left of the image. You can see the port on the right, on the bay. In the near field, there's houses, there's parks, there's roads. Everything crashes together in San Francisco. But what I want to do with this talk again and again is look inside the guts of things. So let's look at the guts of San Francisco. To distill it down, San Francisco is 123 square kilometers with 850,000 people. And the activity of those people emits four and a half tons of CO2 every year. We want to do something about that CO2, and we want to improve the lives of those people. Turns out, almost half of that carbon emission comes from driving cars within the city limits. This is one of the big problems of modern urban life. It is something we will have to tackle. There is no getting away from it. And the question is how? Conveniently, I'm talking about San Francisco, and so we have a solution that's perfect for everyone, the Tesla Model S. Problem solved, no issue. Everyone in San Francisco can, of course, afford this 70,000 euro car. Well, of course not. And that got me to wondering, what can we do? And so for the first time of this talk, first of many, let's look inside. This is why a Tesla Model S is 70,000 euro, because inside it is a battery that costs Tesla something like 14,000 euros. As far as the smartest people on the internet can determine, that's what this battery costs. I'm a materials engineer. It sounds roughly reasonable. I can promise you it's not 5,000 euros. Their, ta their costs are, of course, coming down. They promise you big things because they're building a gigafactory. I almost cried when Tesla announced construction of the gigafactory. And they were not tears of happiness. Because building that factory was an admission of defeat. And to see it as anything else is to get caught in the hype machine. You build a gigantic factory when you have given up on the advancement of the technology. When you say, OK, it's as good as it's going to be. And now we're going to just get what economies we can from making a lot of it. And to see that happen in the most innovative car company, and to see that happen in batteries, which we were determined, depending on for energy for mobility, that was really heartbreaking for me. Because batteries, at the prices that they're at, are not going to work for moving goods. They're OK for moving people. right? You can squeak by with that Tesla, 70,000 euros. And maybe the Model 3 will be half that price. But 
if you scale this up to a truck that weighs 20 times what a Model S weighs, you need 20 times the battery. And maybe it's not 20 times the cost, which would be almost 300,000 euros. Maybe it's only 200,000 euros. But that's not acceptable for trucking. And regardless, the battery in a Tesla Model S is 500 kilos. And so the battery for this truck would be 10,000. So electric mobility is a part of the solution. Batteries are a part of the solution. We need a bigger story. Another thing. I want to raise a question about is how we use land in our cities. And we'll be tying back to these electric cars in just a second. San Francisco is 6% parking spaces. Surface parking is seven square kilometers. San Francisco is the only city in the United States that does a parking space census. So I can tell you this figure exactly if you want. We then have 18 square kilometers of public roads. This is the opportunity space for self-driving cars to reinvent our city. We can reuse some of this land. And the dream is that we'd like to recapture almost all of the parking spaces and some of the roads, because self-driving cars will use this space more efficiently. However, battery electric vehicles need to charge. And so if we want to turn the roads and the parking spaces into parks, Right, right now, parking spaces plus roads is more than parks in San Francisco. I would love that to be different. If we want to change that, we need to do something about charging. Based on how much driving is done within San Francisco every day, if you wanted to charge all of its, electric, all of its cars, if they were electric, it would be 500,000 hours of charging. And that's assuming the fastest charging that your home, so the local distribution grid, can allow. We couldn't have a city of superchargers. Our electricity grid wouldn't survive. So if you do as well as you can, it would be 500,000 hours of charging. What that means is cars are going to be sitting around a lot, which means we have to keep those parking spaces. So there's a conflict here between the self-driving cars, between the electric battery vehicles. There's another aspect to this, too, which is that if self-driving cars act like fleet cars, right? So they're an asset that's generating value, because they don't need to be your personal car. Or even if they are your personal car, you can loan it out to a ride-sharing service without any trouble. If it's charging, it's not making money. So you want to get these charging times down, because you want to recapture urban land. You want to generate as much value as you can from your car. Another piece of self-driving cars, right? This is the beautiful. Audi self-driving race car. Again, let's look at the guts. This is what makes it self-driving. The entire trunk is full of computer hardware. So question, who thinks this can get smaller? Right? Are you confident that the hardware in this trunk will eventually shrink? I'm completely confident of this. Right? It's a no-brainer. The production version of this vehicle will have a tiny chip that does all of this. Now. This is the Toyota Mirai. This is a hydrogen fuel cell car. It's on sale in California. It's a very small part of the public story of what's happening in alternative fueled vehicles, but I think it's an important thing to consider because hydrogen cars have some real benefits over battery electric cars. They fill in three minutes to three to 400 miles of range, so five to 600 kilometers immediately. What that means is that you can get close to 100% utilization. So you don't need to have your cars sitting around. So you don't need to keep those parking spaces. The weight of a hydrogen fuel system is between 10% and 20% of the equivalent battery system. So you can talk about this working for trucking. That's interesting, right? Suddenly, we have the possibility of a complement, something that will work alongside battery vehicles, but handle all the things that they're bad at, heavy vehicles, long distances, fast charging. I really and deeply believe that there's an opportunity for both of these fuels to work together. Here are the guts of that Toyota Mirai. So on the left, you see the, fuel, the air intake system, the bottom left, fuel cell, 
And then the bright yellow things are your two hydrogen tanks. Those are pretty big and ugly, and they take up a bunch of passenger and trunk space. Now, how confident are you that these things can get smaller? It's not as obvious, right? With the computer chips, it was obvious. So I and my colleagues looked at this, looked at cars like this, and we said, this needs to get smaller and more convenient. There needs to be a way to make this better. And that's why we founded Volute, because we want to make the hydrogen car actually functional for users so that it can have spacious interior, real cargo space, easy filling, high utilization rates, so that you can move goods, so that you can have convenient self-driving vehicles. This is how we did it. This is our hydrogen tank. Every other hydrogen tank is a big beer keg. It's that barrel like you saw in the picture. Ours folds flat, and this makes all the difference. It fits in the bottom of the vehicle exactly where that Tesla battery would go. So you as an automaker can have a single platform where you either slot in your battery or your hydrogen tank, depending on the application you're se selling the car for. In addition, this technology has some real advantages in filling. For the engineers in the audience, you might notice that this looks like a heat exchanger. It turns out that it acts like a heat exchanger. So what that means is we make the filling stations cheaper. The most expensive part of the hydrogen filling stations, all five of them, is that you have to cool the hydrogen. You have to cool it to negative 40 degrees centigrade. This is a reliability problem. It's why filling stations can't be mobile, and it's a huge cost problem. Our tank dissipates the heat very easily. We can take hydrogen at room temperature. That's game changing, because it's a big piece in solving the chicken egg problem of hydrogen. We got the filling station cost down. Here's what our tank would look like inside a truck. I pick a truck and not a car, because we will not compete with Tesla in the long term in luxury passenger cars. But in taxis, in work trucks, these are things where batteries are very challenging. And I know Tesla will announce their big 18-wheeler at some point. They've been teasing it on Twitter. I imagine that that's going to be a port vehicle in California where there's short hauling, so 10-kilometer trips, and big government incentives. We'll see. I always wish them the best of luck because I think every environmentally friendly form of transportation is good. But here, what we're doing is we're using unused space in the vehicle, so the spare tire where the gasoline tank would go, and we can build a whole hydrogen fuel system in there. Now the question of filling stations, and I'm going to pull it all together. Autonomous vehicles, self-driving vehicles, give you an incredible opportunity to try out a variety of fuels. Because the cars can go to the filling stations themselves without you, even if the filling stations need to be operated by a person. What that means is you build one filling station or two, and you serve all of San Francisco. Maybe it's a big filling station, but the cars just go there. And so if you want to try hydrogen, great. If you want to try natural gas, methane, fine. If you're in China and you want to do a bunch of methanol, also fine. It's much easier in an autonomous vehicle world to try out alternative fuels. Hydrogen's my preferred alternative fuel because there's a clear path to zero emission once you make hydrogen from either renewable methane or from renewable electricity and water. However, the core thing is there's this opportunity to free ourselves from our existing infrastructure. Gasoline stations today are a real estate play. You pick locations where people drive by. That's going to disappear. People won't be paying attention to needing to fill when they're in a self-driving car. The car will deal with it. Preferably, the car will deal with it when people aren't in the car. So if we rethink where the filling stations go, we can unlock more of our urban infrastructure and unlock more ability to rethink our land use. This all comes back together. If we rethink how we move goods autonomously in vehicles that have fuel and not batteries, granted very clean fuel, but fuel so they can refill quickly, so they don't weigh too much. Again, there's an opportunity to rethink how we move those goods through cities and when. 
The message I want to leave you with is alternative fuels, battery electric, hydrogen, methane, everything else, is crashing into autonomous vehicles. These aren't independent phenomena. And we have to consider the issues of both together if we want to bring our cities into the new century of intelligent mobility. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take questions. Dan, thank you so much. Let's take a question right here. You mentioned the cost of the battery being 14,000 and being it way too expensive for the truck. What's the cost of your, of your hydrogen fuel system? It's a great question. So right now, the fuel system in a typical hydrogen car costs about 10,000 US dollars, so 9,000 euros. We see a very, very clear path to cutting that by about three. So to be about $3,000, 3,000 euros. I would say that starts to be really good enough where it's still a, the major piece of hardware in the vehicle. However, considering you're getting rid of the engine and a fuel cell, when done well, is cheaper than an engine, there's an opportunity there. I'd also say that hydrogen is much cheaper than gasoline when produced well. One of the interesting ironies of fuel cell vehicles is nobody knows what to charge for hydrogen yet, but we'll figure it out. So the best answer to your question I can give is there's a clear path to low-cost vehicles here. OK, this is going to have to be the last question, so go ahead, please. Make it a good one. All right. How long can you keep the, the tank cooled? Ah, so the tank does not need to be cooled. It just needs to get rid of the heat that comes from filling with hydrogen. How do you do that? It's How totally passive. So the, what happens is hydrogen goes into the tank, and unlike almost every other gas, it heats up when it expands. It's backwards. So what that means is you need to then dissipate all that heat. And the way we do that is just into the walls of the tank. Our tank has more surface area, and so it can take the heat more easily than a standard barrel-shaped tank. So it's that simple. So you can, you can keep hydrogen indefinitely inside a tank like that? Indefinitely, right? yeah. Whoa. OK. OK. Dan, that is such a promising technology and so much to talk about. Guys, I encourage you to approach Dan on the sidelines during the lunch break and ask him your questions, connect, exchange, and that's what Cube is all about. Let's get a big round of applause for Dan from Volute. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.